today we're being asked to consider the priority of godly character by considering a time in the early monarchy of Israel, the time of the downfall of David before the eyes of King Saul, a time of David's flight to safety and his exile into the wilderness. Now, as we consider this notion of godly character, I need to confess we aren't doing all 10 chapters that Terry outlined for me. Um, but we will focus in on a couple of key events. But as we consider the notion of the priority of godly character, I'd like us to consider first the ascendancy of King Saul. Um, it was following his first great victory where all Israel gathered with Samuel at Gilgal to renew the kingdom there with sacrifices and great joy. And there the people made Saul king before the Lord. But it is here in this early portion of Saul's reign that we learn that the priority of godly character is not an issue for the king alone. It's a task assigned to the fullness of the nation, every tribe, every clan, and every member. Samuel warns the people in 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13 to 15, and he says, Now therefore, here is the king whom you've chosen, whom you have asked for, and behold, the Lord has set a king over you. If you will fear the Lord and serve him and listen to his voice and not rebel against the command of the Lord, then both you and also the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God. If you will not listen to the voice of your Lord, but rebel against the command of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you, as it was against your fathers. Samuel's charge to the people is basically to say that as far as their hearts would rise in devotion and obedience to the Lord, so far the heart of their king would rise in devotion and obedience to the Lord. So far as godly character was a priority to them, godly character would be manifested in their king, and it would be a blessing and a glory to their nation. Of course, the inverse is, ob is also true. Obstinance, disobedience, wickedness, and evil in the people would bring about the same in their king and result in hard-heartedness and unbelief towards the Lord. Samuel continues in verse 15, if you will not listen to the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the command of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you as it was against your fathers. Um, it's often said that nations get the governments they deserve, and governments get the people they deserve. And we can see here where this idea comes from. As soon as Samuel had uttered these words, the people realized they'd made a massive mistake. For deep down they knew they could not live up to this arrangement for they were just as stubborn and hard-hearted as any Israelite who had ever gone before them. Frustrated with God, they'd been calling for a king, not merely to deliver them from external enemies, but in a sense to deliver them from God himself. But here and now, realizing their error, they would call out to Samuel for deliverance from themselves. What had they done? In chapter 12, beginning in verse 19, we read, Then all the people said to Samuel, Pray for your servants to the Lord your God that we might not die, for we have added to all of our sins this evil by asking for ourselves a king. And Samuel said to the people, Do not fear. You have committed all this evil. Yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. You must not turn aside, for then you would go after futile things which cannot profit or deliver because they are futile. For the Lord will not abandon his people on account of his great name because the Lord has been pleased to make you a people for himself. So it's important to note at the outset that the people had done evil in asking for a king. Yet despite this evil, they had the assurance from Samuel not to abandon hope in God and to persevere, not because of their goodness, but because of the goodness of their God. This is instructive for us even to this day our relationship with God, our portion in him is de determined first and foremost by his character and his desire and his action. For the sake of his own honor, the Lord will complete what he has started. God's character matters. So don't remain in your faults, but persevere in seeking the Lord. Be confident in him because while we are not good, he is good. And it's on account of his great name and because he has chosen us, that we have the freedom to seek him at all. Have we ourselves ever doubted God's character and looked to find ourselves a more user-friendly Savior or Lord? 
what evils perhaps have we committed in seeking a king according to our own choosing? Be convicted, but do not fear. Rather, persevere. You must not turn aside, for then you would go after futile things, which cannot profit or deliver because they are futile. For the Lord will not abandon his people on account of his great name, because the Lord has been pleased to make you a people for himself. If this is true under Israel, or for Israel under Saul, is that not truer still for us who are under Christ? Is he not our king? Do not fear, for the Lord will not abandon his people on account of his great name, because the Lord has been pleased to make you a people for himself. In the monarchy of Israel, it seems that the godliness of any of these earthly kings, be they Saul's or David's, is inextricably linked to the goodness of the people. This is an obvious weakness in this system of monarchy. If the monarchy of God himself was insufficient to produce a good and governable people, how much less sufficient is the monarchy of men? Since both systems were insufficient, the reality is that a new kind of people with a new sort of king would be required, bringing with it a new kind of kingdom that would produce from its people the kingdom of priests and the holy nation that God had called Israel to be in Exodus chapter 19. Samuel continues on. In verse 23, he says, As for me, far be it for me that I should commit sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you. But I will instruct you in the good and right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. For consider what great things he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, both you and your king will be swept away. If Samuel, prophet and priest to this stubborn people, intercedes and instructs them patiently and with compassion, if he prays for them and instructs them to encourage them in the good and right way, how much more does our prophet, priest, and king, the Lord Jesus, intercede, instruct, and deliver us? If Samuel was faithful, Christ be more faithful still. Let us then fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all of our hearts by considering what great things he has done for us. Because despite ourselves, in our king we can never be swept away, for he can never be swept away. Accordingly, if we want to talk at all about the priority of godly character, we must first acknowledge the priority of God's character, for his character is prior to us. It is the character of God which grounds our confidence in him, and as such, God's character is the unshakable grounds for godly character in his people. From what he has done, we have confidence in what he will yet do. It is from our confidence in God's goodness that we find the confidence to live as godly people in the face of trials of various kinds. Apart from the knowledge of the character of God, how can we be secure in our hope and salvation in him? How can he be our delight and how can we be satisfied in him if we do not trust him? Let us then fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all of our hearts by considering what great things he has done for us. Because in our king, he can never be swept away. We can never be swept away for we have a better king. So that was my introduction. Let's have a word of prayer. Um, Lord, we thank you for this day on which you've prepared for us in the beloved. We are gathered by your spirit that we might draw near in reverent and joyful worship, that we might be challenged, convicted, forgiven, encouraged, even torn down and built up again. Renew us in your spirit this morning, even as you reveal yourself to us this day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've just done a little survey of chapters 11, 12, Uh, And if we wanted to continue, chapters 13, 14, and 15 further illustrate the problem of a lack of confidence in the character of God yielding ungodly character in both the people and the king. In these pages, we find a fearful and chaotic people that have produced a fearful and chaotic king. Why are they fearful? Well, for one, they were under threat. For another, they lack confidence in God's character and in his willingness to save and to be faithful to his promises. Chapter 15 is especially important because it is the chapter of Saul's downfall, where Saul is rejected as being king, for Saul has rejected the word of the Lord. He has exchanged it 
for fear of the people. In proving his case, famous, Samuel famously declares to Saul, obedience is better than sacrifice. The next period of time would not be quiet for Saul, but he would soldier on courageously in the position of king, moving from conflict to conflict to conflict as nations waged war against Israel, each in their turn. His kingdom would not know peace all the days of his life. In the meantime, David was anointed in secret in his father's house. But it was about that time that the Spirit of God descended on David, even as it had departed from Saul. And if we remember the unlikely call of David and the unlikely victory over Goliath, we know that David has already become Saul's beloved harpist, his armor bearer, and is described as being a man of character and accomplishment. But it's immediately following the famous encounter between the armies of Israel and the Philistines and their dreaded champion Goliath that gives rise to the open conflict between Saul and God as Saul sought to kill David. Though Saul was head and shoulders above the rest of Israel, he would not go to war against this giant. Nobody would. The people trembled, and their king trembled with them. But it was David the youth who would come on the scene and declare with his mouth the hidden realities in his heart. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. These words of confidence in God's character were words that yielded action. The scriptures do not say without reason that anyone who trusts in him will not be put to shame. The confidence that David brought forward on the field before Goliath was not a confidence in his sling or stone or his skill in delivering a killing blow, which was surely justified, but confidence in the God who delivers his people, who makes promises to them about their future. He is the God who will not let his people be put to shame for the sake of their hope in him. The Lord was with David and provided this improbable victory, but following this victory, the story soon takes a turn for the worse. As they were returning from the battle, the women come out from all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul. With tambourines of joy and musical instruments, the women sang and played and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. It was the fateful song of the women as they praised this other that pierced Saul's ears and penetrated his heart, stirring up the fear even as they wounded his pride. The terror of Goliath may have passed, but the new terror had ascended to reign on the throne of Saul's heart, stirring up his fear even as it wounded his pride. The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. What could Saul do but say to himself, they have ascribed to David ten thousands, but to me they have ascribed thousands. What more can he have but the kingdom? Despite his former affection for David, 1 Samuel 18, 12 teaches us that Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. It would seem that Saul did not know David any better than he had known God. Saul, having fought in wars against the enemies of God's people for the last 30 years, was about to go to war against God himself. If Samuel had declared um, Saul's previous actions a rebellion, what is it called when you raise an insurrection? Having returned home following the victory, Saul lashes out with a preemptive strike, seeking to pin his enemy's new chosen favorite to the wall with his spear. And so David ran, and he ran, and he ran. And if you want to follow along, now we're going to dip into 1 Samuel chapter 21. Starting in verse 1, Then David came to Nob, to Ahimelech the priest, and Ahimelech came trembling to meet David and said to him, Why are you alone with no one with you? David said to Ahimelech the priest, The king has commissioned me with a matter and has said to me, No one is to know anything about the matter on which I am sending you and which I have commissioned you. And I have directed the young men to a certain place. Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever can be found. Now, David, in his distress, has fled to the tabernacle of God, surely a place of great comfort in a day of trouble. As he would later write in Psalm 27, 5, For in this time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. How good is it that we have a God to run to 
who receives us, who hears our troubles, and from whom we may ask and expect direction and relief. However, in our story, David himself, this lion of the valley of, El- of Elah, has yet to live up to these his, these, his own words. His distressed condition is obvious to Ahimelech, who questions him with urgency about his sorry condition. Why are you alone and no one is with you? But rather than approaching the priest of God uprightly and forthrightly, did you notice how David lied to him? The king has ordered me on some business, so don't tell anybody what it is. This is not a sophisticated lie. It's a clumsy lie, a hurried lie, by which he seeks to save himself. What man of war forgets his sword? What urgent mission has him flying in such disarray? David, too, it seems, is an ordinary man. At times, perhaps, a man of iron, but like Saul, like us, he's a man of iron with feet of clay. But notice how the scripture does not conceal or justify David's dishonesty. Not only was it unnecessary, but it proved to be of bad consequence, for David's dishonesty would ultimately result in the deaths of Ahimelech and the priests of the Lord by the hand of Saul. Had he been honest with them, they would have been forewarned of Saul's murderous intent and been more cautious. Now David would have the opportunity for regret in the future, but for now it seems that he merely wanted to save his skin in the most expeditious way possible. Isn't this just the way with us too? Part iron, part clay, maybe mostly clay. Living with the regrets for the consequences of our unbelief. When we lie to save ourselves, is it not because we lack the courage to stand in the strength of our God? Even if we are delivered through a self-serving lie, do we not injure ourselves and wound our consciences in the process? This lie and David's wounded conscience, they're not written for our imitation, but for our warning and instruction. Verse four, the priest answered David and said, there's no ordinary bread on hand, but there is consecrated bread. If only the young men have kept themselves from women. Out of a sense of urgency, Ahimelech supposed that David and his men might eat the slightly expired bread of the presence. God was done with it. Now it's the property of the priest for his own needs. In verse five, David answered and said to the priest, be assured women have been denied to us as previously when I left the bodies of the young men, they were consecrated. Though it was an ordinary journey, how much more will their bodies be consecrated today? So the priest gave him the consecrated bread. Here, David doubles down. He lies again. He has no men, let alone any knowledge of their purity. David goes over the top with his assurances to the priest to get what he wants. Notice how the priority of God's character has completely evaporated from David's horizon. As well as the priority of God, as, and as the priority of God's character evaporates, David's character evaporates with it. But while David has no companions with him, David is not alone at the tabernacle that day. For alongside David and Ahimelech, there's another character, Doeg the Edomite. In verse 7, now one of the servants of Saul was there that day and detained before the Lord, and his name was Doeg the Edomite, the chief of Saul's shepherds. The author of 1 Samuel makes sure that we don't miss the irony and the foreshadowing. The king's chief shepherd alongside the shepherd who would be king. Doeg is detained before the Lord on a religious matter, but he has no heart for God. While David lies to the priest, but is the man after God's own heart. Whom is the truer shepherd? But did you notice how David's tone gets a bit more urgent after after recognizing Doeg? Verse 8, David says to Ahimelech, Uh, Now, there's no spear or sword on hand, is there? Um, I brought neither my sword nor my weapons with me because the king's matter was urgent. The priest said, The sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, behold, it is wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you would take it for yourself, take it, for there is no other except it here. And David said, There is none like it. Give it to me. Now, we've already discussed the fall of Saul and learned that obedience is better than sacrifice. But in this story, we're confronted with some of the teaching from the son of David, from Matthew 12, who taught from this story that while it wasn't permissible for David to eat the priest's bread, mercy is better than sacrifice. In doing so, Jesus strongly affirms that the mercy of God to sinners was greater than any formalities. After all, Jesus did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. 
In this story, we have David compromised by both fear and sin, but called by God nonetheless. It's often said that God does not call the qualified, but that he qualifies the called. And David receives the mercy in the tabernacle of God through the priest of God in the form of consecrated bread and a sword, not because of David's lies or because David deserved the help, but purely because David needed mercy. David needed God's mercy to persevere so God could accomplish his purpose through him. In David's failure and in God's mercy, do we not see another demonstration of the priority of God's character, especially when David's own character had folded like a cheap tent. Now, fear can cause us to make some pretty bad decisions in life, and I'm certain that we can all relate. But David's next part, this next part of the story is truly mind-blowing. So David's next brainwave is to flee the territory of Israel and seek shelter in Philistine country. But not just any old, out-of-the-way part of the territory, David somehow decides it's a good idea to go to Gath, to Goliath's hometown, while carrying Goliath's sword. Verse 10, David set out and fled that day from Saul and went to Achish, king of Gath. But the servants of Achish said to him, is this not David, king of the land? Did they not sing of this one as they danced, saying, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands? David took these words to heart and greatly feared Achish, king of Gath. So what words did David take to heart? Was it the words of his anointing? No. Was it the words of God's faithfulness to him and his people? No. But it was the words of the enemy that indicated that David was naked and alone, unsafe, isolated, and afraid. Yes, these are the words that David took to heart and feared greatly. Where is the confidence of this champion? Had God departed from David, or had David departed from God? Had God changed, or had David? Honestly, what did David expect to happen here? Well, the answer is that God had not departed from David, nor had God changed, nor really had David changed. David was a man, like Saul, like you, like me, weak and from first to last needing the mercy of God, which flows from the rock-solid character of God. The priority of God's character forms the godly character of his people. But this happens in fits and starts. Over time, it admits success and failures that we might not be filled with pride. It's written that God gives his grace to the humble. And it's also written in Psalm 25, 9 that he guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. Needless to say, David is learning a valuable lesson here. Even the servants of Achish identify the absurdity of David's visit. Is this not David, king of the land? It's evident that the court of Achish knew who David was, even if David had forgotten. David's identity is clearly known. Everyone knows his deeds, his reputation, as well as his anointing and future promises. His enemies know him better than himself. Did David think that he had arrived in court in obscurity? Goliath had been the champion of this kingdom. His equipment, his armor, his weapons were as famed as he. After all, had not David just mentioned how there was no sword like Goliath's sword? And here David comes to the throne of the enemy, bearing Goliath's sword into the citadel of Gath. Why not just bring Goliath's severed head while he was at it? Surely David was a madman. Verse 13. So he disguised his sanity while in their sight and acted insanely in their custody and scribbled on the doors of the gate and drooled on his beard. Then Achish said to his servants, Look, see this man is behaving like an insane person. Why have you brought him to me? Do I lack insane people? that you've brought this one to behave like an insane person in my presence? Shall this one come into my house? Perhaps if Goliath had been inconvenient to the king, David might just have been able to find shelter out of the reach of Saul. But it turns out that David's arrival was greeted with complete incredulity by Achish and his court. They simply could not believe that David was in his right mind. While David was greatly feared, while David greatly feared Achish at this point, It would seem perhaps that the Philistines feared him more. Releasing the madmen from their custody, perhaps less perhaps he strike them down. But surely too, this is the preserving hand of God's mercy on David's life. Not that David deserved it, but because of God's character. We turn to chapter 22. David departs from there and he escapes to the cave of Abdullam. 
And when his brothers and all his father's household heard about it, they went down from there to him. And everyone who was in distress and everyone who was in debt and everyone who was discontented gathered to him. And he became a captain over them. Now there were about 400 men with him. So far, David had ran from Ramah to Naoth and from Naoth to Nob and from Nob to Gath and from Gath to this cave in Adullam. And David finally pauses to gather himself in Judah, having left behind the Philistine territory, and his family, perhaps under threat from King Saul themselves, also flee to join David in hiding. At least David was among friends and was no longer alone. Then something interesting happens in verse 2. Besides his family, others followed David into exile. Then any, everyone who was in distress and everyone who was in debt and everyone who was discontented gathered to him and he became a captain over them and there were about 400 with him. Now this seems like an unlikely army. The stressed, the indebted, those who are embittered of soul, David becomes lord and captain over them David didn't turn any of these refugees or malcontents away. He welcomed all who would put their faith in himself. His lot would be their lot, and it seemed that their lot would be his lot. I don't know about you, but folks who run away from their debts or in distress or otherwise discontented might not make for the best group of followers. Of course, it's entirely possible that some of these folks were suffering on account of some relationship they had with David or his family and were stressed and embittered as a result. Those who were in debt might simply have been looking for a chance to leave their burdens behind and find new opportunities. But all of these individuals were dissatisfied either with the current political situation in Israel or their current personal situation in Israel and were looking forward to a new king and a better kingdom. But when I think of David, the captain of the disaffected, I like to think of the son of David, our captain and Lord. Have we not fled to him for safety? Are we not the disaffected of this age, looking to a new kingdom, bringing with us only our debts, our distress, and our discontentment of soul? What commends us to the hospitality of Christ? Is it not our poverty and need? What do we find in our greater David but shelter, refreshment, and peace? But in the meantime, this lesser David, all he could promise his people was hardship and exile until, Lord willing, he took possession of his kingdom. But for the sake of the hope of the kingdom, they remained by his side and shared in his sufferings. How like ourselves, what are we promised in this world? Troubles. But what are we called to do? Rejoice and follow our captain who has gone before us and has already overcome the world. Now, while our captain has overcome and has ascended and has already ascended into his kingdom and is ruling over all things, David and his followers had yet to overcome their troubles and have yet to sit in security. But first things first, David moves to secure his family. So they stealthily trek through the territory of Israel and around the Sea of Galilee and into the territory of Moab so David could shelter his family there. Then Saul heard that David and his men who were with them had been discovered. Now Saul was in Gibeah, sitting under the tamarisk tree on the height with the spear in his hand, and all his servants were standing in front of him. And Saul said to his servants, who were standing in front of him? Now hear now, you Benjamites, will the son of Jesse really give you all fields and vineyards? Will he make you all commanders of thousands and hundreds? For all of you had conspired against me. So there is no one who informs me when my son makes a covenant with the son of Jesse. And there is none of you who cares about me or informs me that my son has stirred up his servant against me to lie in ambush as it is this day. Perhaps at one point in our lives we have known a violent person, an unpredictable person in word or deed, loving in one moment, breathing out threats and curses against you in the next. If you notice anything about Saul... We might notice his growing volatility, his irrationality, his propensity to threats and violence. In every story since chapter 18, what personal article of his figures most prominently? Is it not his spear in hand? Chapter 18, 19, 20, 22, 26 highlight the spear as a focal point of Saul's fierce and unpredictable wrath. Do you hear the paranoid accusations in Saul's words? He lashes out against those who are most loyal to him. His tribesmen, even his son, is thought to have conspired against him. 
Saul bellows in verse eight, for all of you have conspired against me. There is no one who informs me when my son makes a covenant with the son of Jesse. There's none of you who cares for me or informs me that my son has stirred up my servant against me. Saul is such a victim. Everyone is conspiring against him. See how he makes excuses for his violence and wrath by blaming others. For you all have conspired against me. My son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in ambush. Saul considers his activities to be those of self-defense. But he is filled with an evil spirit of fear and mistrust and accusation. Saul forgets or suppresses the fact that at every turn, every time he lays hold of his spear in fear and anger to smite David, Saul is in effect lifting his spear against God. Now this war against God is going to take a devastating an irrecoverable turn. Saul was looking for loyal captains who would execute his commands without mercy. Who would take the opportunity? Verse 9. Then Doeg the Edomite, who was standing in front of the servants of Saul, responded and said, I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob, to Ahimelech the priest. And he inquired of the Lord for him and gave him provisions and gave him the sword of Goliath the Philistine. <clears throat> if it was conspiracy for Saul's countrymen, to fail to tell him that David and Jonathan had sworn a covenant of friendship before David was even under suspicion. How much more was a conspiracy to aid David when he was already on the run? So the king sent messengers to summon Ahimelech the priest and all the priests in his clan who were in Nob with him, and they came to the king, and Saul interrogated Ahimelech. Saul said, Listen now, son of Ahitub. And he said and replied, Here I am, my lord. Saul said to him, Why have you and the son of Jesse conspired against me, in that you've given him bread and a sword, and have inquired of God for him, so that he would rise up against me by lying in ambush as it is this day? Again, we have the accusations of conspiracy. Why have you and the son of Jesse, as if they were in cahoots to overthrow Saul? Ahimelech is merely doing what the Lord requires of him, a service of mercy. Notice what Saul does. He accuses Ahimelech and David of what he himself is doing. This is a case of confession through projection. Accuse your enemy of the thing that you yourself are doing or have already done. The falsity of this accusation is proved by Ahimelech's response. First, his response, <clears throat> first his response is, the, is coming to the summons of Saul. He leaves behind the care of the tabernacle to answer the king. If he were guilty, why would he have answered the summons? And secondly, he just points out the insanity of Saul's accusations. In verse 14, Ahimelech answers the king and says, And who among all your servants is as faithful as David, the king's old son-in-law, who is commander over your bodyguard and is honored in your house? Did I not just begin to inquire of God for him today? Far be it from me. Do not let the king impute anything against his servant or against any of the household of my father because your servant knows nothing of this whole affair. Ahimelech is mad. He doesn't grovel or apologize. He confronts the king directly with the righteousness of his cause. Not only did Ahimelech not conspire against the king in caring for David, Ahimelech was serving the king, the king's house, the kingdom at large, and was doing his job as priest of God for David. Ahimelech's words are the words of righteous indignation, a rebuke and a condemnation of Saul the king. But the king said, you shall certainly die, Ahimelech, you and all your father's household. And the king said to the guards who were attending him, turn around and put the priests of the Lord to death, because their hand is also with David, and because they knew that he was fleeing and did not inform me. But the servants of the king were unwilling to reach out their hands to attack the priests of the Lord. Ahimelech's rebuke might not have swayed the king, but it certainly swayed the king's clansmen, his fellow Benjamites, who were unwilling to reach out with their hands to attack the priest of the Lord. Who then would do the, Lord, uh, the king's dirty work? Well, the king said to Doeg, turn around you and attack the priests, and Doeg the Edomite turned around and attacked the priests. And he killed on that day 85 men who wore the linen ephod. And he struck Nob, the city of the priests, with the edge of the sword, both men and women, children and infants. He struck the oxen, the donkeys, the sheep with the edge of the sword. While David is called a, a man after God's own heart, Doeg the Edomite is certainly a man after Saul's own heart. This is an escalation of Saul's warfare, not against David, but against God. This Saul, from whom God had stripped both king and clothing, 
is now stripped of all reason. Saul lashes out against God as if his spear could pin God to the wall. What Saul had refused to do for God in in chapter 15 with the Amalekites, he now does for himself, leading an unholy war against the city of priests. He dedicates the entire city to the judgment of his own wrath, as if he could somehow conquer God. Who's greater than God? (laughs) It seems that in his madness, Saul was up for the contest. It seems, however, at least one man is preserved from destruction. It's Abiathar. And he escapes and flees to David and tells him of the slaying of the priest of the Lord. In verse 22, David says to Abiathar, I knew on that day when Doeg the Edomite was there that he would certainly tell Saul, I'm responsible for the death of the people in your father's household. David confesses his responsibility to Abiathar for the death of his family. Yet Abiathar accepts and welcomes David's protection. Ahimelech, his name is interesting. It means brother of the king. Uh, He was killed by a king who should have been a brother to him. As Ahimelech is killed, he holds on to his integrity and righteousness for he, as a faithful priest, has by faith laid hold of a greater kingdom and a much greater king. Enter into your rest, good and faithful servant. Ahimelech has prioritized the character of God. That godly character might be prioritized in him. And trust in God was most certainly, he was most certainly not put to shame. Saul, on the other hand, has been plunged into the depths of complete and utter degradation. What path back would there be for Saul? In raising his hand against both the priests, the Lord, as well as the Lord's anointed, had he not raised his hand against God himself? This is not the end of the beginning for Saul, but rather the beginning of the end. For another 10 or 12 years, Saul would cling to power, chasing David across the realm. And twice Saul would fall into David's hands. And twice David would extend mercy to Saul. And twice Saul would repent. But his repentance would not last. David's mercy would spark amazing confessions from Saul. And I like to think that Saul mourned for the loss of his righteousness over who he once was. But he never had hope enough in the character of God to see a renewed place for himself in God's kingdom. Hopelessness is a dangerous place to live. It's written in Ecclesiastes that while there is life, there is hope, and better a live dog than a dead lion. In reality, it's never too late for repentance until you draw your last breath. Better a live dog than a dead lion. For when life is gone, there remains no hope. Saul should have remembered the words of Samuel to the people those many years before. Do not fear. You have committed all this evil, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. You must not turn aside, for then you would go after futile things which cannot profit or deliver because they are futile. For the Lord will not abandon his people on account of his great name, because the Lord has been pleased to make you a people for himself." In the end, it's clear that Saul is consumed in futility, not in the futility of going to war against the Philistines, but in the futility of going to war against God. Saul had neglected the priority of the character of God, who for the sake of his own name will not abandon his people, and he was pleased to make a people for himself. In neglecting this priority, Saul had only neglected himself and had fallen into ruin and despair despite the abundant mercies offered to him. But ultimately, Saul and his three sons would fall as Saul had lived, as lions in battle, no live dogs among them. For us, let this be instructive this day, that our relationship with God, our portion in him, is determined first and foremost by his character and his desire and his action. It is he who comes down to us And it's he who was lifted up for us. For the sake of his own honor, the Lord will complete what he has started. God's character matters. So don't remain in your faults, but persevere in seeking the Lord and be confident in him. Because while we ourselves are not good, he is good. And it's on account of his great name. And because he has chosen us that we have the freedom and ability to seek him at all. Let's have a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for being a God who, for the sake of the honor of your name, abandons not your people. 
Rather, it pleases you to make a people for yourself. And by your grace, we are that people, your special possession, an army of the disaffected gathered to your goodness. We ask you, Lord, to reveal your character to us that we might be formed in your character according to your word. Amen.